Resonance is one of the most important structural factors that we find in the Lewis structures of organic molecules. And in the last video, we saw four generalized structures that point us to the importance of traditional resonance in a particular molecule. But those four structures don't tell us the whole story. In fact, the identity of the atoms that are part of those structures also plays a role in the importance of resonance for a particular molecule. So in this video, what we're going to do is talk a little bit more about this extremely critical question, when is resonance important for a given molecule? And this will be important not just for traditional resonance, which we've seen already, but also non-traditional resonance, which we'll lay out in the next couple of webcasts. The key question of this video is when is resonance important? The first thing for you to realize is that in the vast majority of organic molecules, Unless we have some sort of rules or guidelines for detecting important resonance structures, we find that most molecules have tons of so-called resonance structures. But the issue is that some of them are more important than others. Let me give you a quick example of this just to illustrate. So here's the molecule naproxen that I'm drawing on this slide. And naproxen is an example of a molecule with important practical applications actually that has tons of resonance structures and tons of different ways to draw this molecule. I'll just draw a few curved arrows on this to illustrate this for you but for example we could involve resonance with the carboxylic acid functional group. We could involve resonance in the naphthalene ring, the fused aromatic ring that you see here and there are all kinds of different arrows that we could draw in this molecule to depict apparently different resonance forms. But the issue of which resonance forms are more important than others is very important to consider. And in the remainder of this video, we're going to lay out the factors that go into detecting and drawing good resonance forms. The first important guideline that we can use to detect good resonance structures concerns sources and sinks. So every resonance form is going to possess a source and a sink, and it's the high energy reactive sources and the low energy reactive electron sinks that point us to good resonance, or as I say on this slide, they signal resonance structures that are important for us. We can also use this idea to detect when a resonance structure will be more important for one molecule than an analogous resonance structure will be in a different molecule. To give you an example, we might consider the enolate anion versus a similar anion with nitrogen rather than oxygen as the negatively charged heteroatom. And we can ask the question, for which of these structures is the resonance form bearing a negative charge on carbon more important? Well, recognizing that nitrogen is a better electron source than oxygen, based on simple electronegativity arguments, we come to the conclusion that there's probably more partial negative charge on the carbon atom in the anion bearing nitrogen rather than the one bearing oxygen or the enolate anion. So good sources and sinks point us to important resonance forms. Similarly, we can make a comparison to an allyl anion, and in this case, we see that the carbon, being the least electronegative element of all, is sharing a lot of negative charge with the other carbon in this structure. Applying this idea in another case allows us to find the most important resonance form for a particular molecule. To do this, one of the first things we'll do is look for the strongest electron sources and the strongest electron sinks in a particular molecule. So when it comes to electron sources, we can zero in on the negatively charged oxygen atom right off the bat. The oxygen is negatively charged and bears high energy lone pairs that can participate in resonance. Furthermore, that good electron source is next to a good electron sink, which we see in the CN double bond. Because the nitrogen is positively charged, this points to a good electron sink. And so now we have a good electron source, a lone pair on oxygen, next to a good electron sink, and this is a key sign that resonance is important in this molecule. We can draw curved arrows to illustrate this resonance, and the resulting most important resonance form reflects that electron flow. So we have an NO double bond, we have a negatively charged carbon, the nitrogen is still positive, and the rest of the molecule remains essentially unchanged in that resonance form. So the key to finding the most important resonance form for this molecule, and the key to recognizing that resonance was important at all, was to see, again, that a good electron source and a good electron sink were next to one another. 
Geometry and orbital overlap is the second key factor. After you've identified a good source and sink next to one another, it's critical to verify that the orbitals associated with the source and sink are able to overlap. In fact, resonance itself is an indication of orbital overlap. The overlap of localized molecular orbitals to produce delocalized orbitals spanning multiple atoms. And when the source and sink orbitals are not able to align in a pi-type fashion, the curved arrows are what I call bogus, meaning that even though the source and the sink are next to one another, we can't draw curved arrows to show their interaction because physically, the orbitals corresponding to that source and sink are unable to overlap efficiently. Let me show you an example of what I mean. The nitrogen atom of dimethyl aniline, which is molecule A on this slide, is a better base than the nitrogen atom of aniline B. Explain why. One of the things we can notice if we consider sources and sinks, first of all, is that the lone pair on the nitrogen atom is a good electron source. And so apparently for both of these molecules, we can draw resonance forms that show the delocalization of the lone pair into the pi star orbital of the benzene ring. The resulting resonance forms suggest that the lone pairs are not that basic, not as basic as we would expect, for example, out of a plain old amine whose lone pair is not in conjugation or involved in traditional resonance with any other sort of group. These three R groups off of the nitrogen then would be alkyl groups or something else unable to participate in resonance. But for whatever reason, A is a decent base, meaning for some reason the resonance arrows that we're drawing here are not as important in the case of A as in the case of B. And the issue really is one of geometry. So let me draw for you the actual conformation of this molecule. So we can lay down the aromatic ring, kind of imagine this bottom part coming out towards you so that the plane of the ring is kind of at an angle to the plane of the screen. And imagine the methyl groups sort of going above and below that plane of the aryl ring and the lone pair coming out in this direction. What's happening here is that because the CH3 groups would interfere sterically with the hydrogens on the benzene ring, the nitrogen rotates to place these CH3 groups perpendicular to that plane. That also has the effect, if you think about the geometry of the nitrogen atom, of turning the orbital associated with the lone pair so that it is in the plane of the aromatic ring. From a resonance perspective then, the orbital corresponding to the lone pair, we take a head-on view of that orbital, and the pi star orbital corresponding to the aromatic ring are at right angles to one another. What this means is that the orbitals cannot interact efficiently. Notice that we have equal amounts of constructive and destructive overlap here, and so the curved arrows associated with this orbital interaction will be a bogus set of curved arrows. Or in other words, the green curved arrows that we drew up here are actually bogus because of the geometric constraints that are put in place when we replace the two H's in plain old aniline with two CH3 groups in dimethyl aniline. The lack of resonance in dimethyl aniline means that the lone pair there is about as basic as a lone pair that we would find, for example, in a plain old amine for which resonance is not important.